My name is Janus Sartz. I'm director of NATO's Strategic Communication Center of Excellence. And welcome to the first of our webinar series that, as a center, uh, we will host during this time while we can't meet in person. So this time, uh, what we're trying to uh, discuss uh, is uh, this uh, infodemic that we're seeing in front of our uh, eyes and how to mitigate disinformation and misinformation. How to, in this uh, time when uh, so much of what we do has moved online, how to uphold our digital security. And lastly, uh, we want to discuss uh, also given the fact that technology can be one of the ways uh, uh, we can solve, at least partly help to solve this COVID-19 uh, problem, where is the boundary in between privacy and the individual and collective security? And what are the trade-offs and balances that we have to say? And uh, for this discussion today, I have Henrik Twetman, senior expert from the Stratcom Center of Excellence, and Nora Bittenetze uh, with us. And I'll start with um, some short overview of how I see this situation, and I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to both experts to, to make their own comments. And then we'll go into a discussion on the, what we see, uh, what are our kind of uh, takeaways from the situation, what are our tips and tricks, what we have to do, and some of the thinking that people can apply in these circumstances to, to lower down this disinformation pressure that is laying increasingly upon the societies, security establishments, and the people trying to uh, fight the COVID, uh, COVID crisis. So my first observation is it's been really quite extraordinary. The level of different kind of uh, false, fake, uh, outright design disinformation that has, has been flooding our disinformation, uh, our, our environment and uh, has been spreading disinformation. Um, the scope and scale is global as is pandemic and no place on the world is safe from it. And as I see, all kinds of different actors are playing in this field. And it's not just a constant uh, strategy of putting out the, 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 the fake news or disinformation. These strategies evolve, and I think we'll have to talk about that a little bit in a while. The other thing that I observe is the the, the, the core element of these uh, disinformation campaigns are digital. Yes, there are quite a lot of more traditional media that have been susceptible to some um, stories or some uh, deliberate, uh, deliberate lies or disinformation uh, techniques, but in my view, this whole, uh, whole uh, um, storm has been mostly happening in a digital space, and that's an, a kind of an acceleration of the, of the uh, process that we've seen. And of course, partly, it, is, it has been driven also by the fact that we, as a society, have been asked to, by staying home, by doing social distancing, or rather called physical distancing, uh, we've been basically pushed to become much more digital than we used to. And also we've seen a, a rapid rise of a, uh, not only digital consumption, but also information consumption across most of the societies. And that, of course, together with the prior existing disinformation ecosystems, networks, have worked in, in, in a ways that has amplified the efficiency and effects of those misinformation and disinformation um, uh, players. Also, we see that not only a state players that we typically talk about in, in, in our research and our look, but also all sorts of non-government players are coming into the picture. There are for-profit actors, scammers that create fake news so that 
people would be buying the fake cures or fake, uh, uh, fake uh, uh, escapes from a problem. There is the uh, hacking issue where some of the disinformation or viral stories have been used to compromise people's digital systems. And there are also these uh, uh, conspiracy theory ecosystems that have been becoming very, very vibrant and have been able to overspill these effects outside of a traditional kind of more or less closed ecosystems of, uh, of, of a given conspiracy theory into the mainstream. And we've seen also uh, the, the uh, inauthentic accounts like robots and, uh, uh, and the uh, hybrid accounts uh, also pick up great volume of, of disin, uh, disinformation dissemination related to COVID. So all sorts of uh, previously seen uh, disinformation is, is, is what we observe in everyday environment. But there is another vulnerability. As we move on to the digital, as we have to, to get our entertainment digital, as we have to make our socialization digital with friends, family, loved ones, we are increasingly giving up our uh, personal data. And that's been one of the problems and issues that we as a center have been raising for quite some time. But at this point, I think that this has become ever more important because now the reason to give it up, to give up your, your, your privacy is just a mere entertainment. And the scope of the data that would be coming out of our societies and the way it can be used later on is something that is worth reflecting. On the other side of an equation, the states have been grappling with a question, how do you use technology to help uh, uh, to, to control the, 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 the virus? There's a number of, uh, of ways, apps being developed by the, com uh, by the companies, apps being developed by the governments, specific solutions for contact tracing, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's once again, has given the first time, I would say, where the democratic governments have been moving in the direction of using people's data uh, for a specific cause. But I think there is, once again, a, a good question to be asked. Where is this uh, limit in between gathering data and keeping people's privacy. Where is the balance? Should we abandon technology as a solution because it's intruding into privacy? Or should we take it up in a balanced way, but where the balance is? I think these are a number of questions that we've been thinking about when we've been observing the situation as it unfolds in front of our eyes that we want to discuss today. And, and, and these are the ones that we want to go through as our today's discussion is, uh, is, 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 is taking place. And now with that introduction, I would love to, to, to turn it over to Hendrik. And I, I, would, I would ask you, Hendrik, uh, as a kind of leading question, when we see what is happening, do you think, is there something new in what we, we see? Or is it just scale? Henrik. Thank you very much, sir. Um, that's a very good question, a very interesting question indeed. It's, it's, um, it's one that's very difficult to answer as well, because obviously some things we see are very new and other things are about the same. Uh, I wanted to frame the discussion today with, uh, uh, with making a couple main points uh, to start off with, uh, because obviously what we have seen the last month or so is really a surge in online disinformation, and it's had quite devastating effects already. So if the debate previously has been about whether or not disinformation is a real problem and if it has real world effects, then it definitely is something that we can't argue with anymore. We've seen that there's been some very devastating real world effects already. Uh, we've seen people, people drinking themselves to death uh, on alcohol by, after believing that alcohol will help cure coronavirus. We've seen people drinking chlorine because they read online that chlorine works to, to um, 
prevent viruses from spreading. And we've seen people setting 5G transmitters on fire because they believe that the 5G towers are emitting coronavirus. So there's no doubt anymore that this information has real world implications. But there were three points that I wanted to, to bring into this discussion today. And the first one was about the, the cognitive landscape of today. The second is one that you already alerted to, Janice, which is the infrastructure of this information. And the third one would be the government responses. So speaking to the cognitive point, I think that the dynamics of this crisis are, are really interesting in this regard, because compared to the pre-crisis times, we are dealing with a completely different cognitive landscape today in our audiences and in our people in, in the, the Western world mainly. Uh, in this landscape, uh, this information is really powerful, as well as other ways of exploiting and manipulating people. We've seen this information on the rise. We've also seen scammers and hackers and all types of other shady people uh, who have exploited the situation in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and a big reason for this, of course, is that people are afraid and they feel a great deal of uncertainty right now. And what this does to us is that, that it makes us very susceptible to very simple answers to complex problems. Uh, and in a situation of uncertainty, we're cognitively always looking to confirm our previously held beliefs, right? So we want to feel secure in an unsecure world. We're looking to confirm what we believe. This makes us extremely susceptible to uh, narratives and pieces of information that are not necessarily true, but that we feel intuitively help us make sense of a complex world, such as the anti-vaccine movement and the anti-5G movement. There are two examples of where, where this cognitive bias is very powerful. At the same time, uh, at the same time as we develop these different cognitive patterns, we also change our media consumption patterns quite drastically. Uh, not only in that we're consuming online media to a bigger extent now, but we're also consuming media that's very directed at one particular issue. So there was a study that came from uh, Ofcom in the UK uh, a couple of days ago that, sh that showed that about 99% of the online UK population access news about COVID-19 at least once a day and that 25% of the online population access news about COVID 20 times a day. Uh, and there is probably no issue ever that's attracted so much attention online. Uh, and when you're constantly searching for information in this vast space that is the internet, you're of course more likely to come across quite questionable information that attracts that's attractive to you based on what you believe. Um, and of course, during quarantine, we also spend more time on social media. That becomes our main conduit for, for social relations. And that means that filter bubbles to that extent they exist becomes very much more important and the algorithms that decide what content we see uh, becomes even more determinative for what we know or what information we process. Uh, the Oxford Reuters Institute found that almost 90% of the disinformation that they had spotted could be traced to social media platforms. So they are really uh, a big issue in this complex puzzle. And to add to that, of course, people are bored out of their minds sitting at home. So they're looking for something to entertain them. They're looking for something that will both decrease their fear, but also help them feel better. So I think most of us have heard about the story of the dolphins returning to Venice in Italy. This is one of these typical fake news stories that was later debunked uh, that really appeals to our need to feel good about something in the middle of this crisis. So the people who are exploiting these vulnerabilities are really good at adapting, finding ways to formulate stories that will appeal to our fears, that will appeal to our boredom, and that will appeal to our cognitive insecurity that we have in this stage. Uh, the second point I wanted to raise was about the infrastructure, and Janis mentioned this already. Uh, in this sense, there's not as much new things going on, I think. Uh, Nora will speak to the platforms a bit later, but we've been talking about the infrastructure for manipulation at the Center of Excellence for a long time. And this infrastructure is not something that was created overnight. It's something that's been around for years. Uh, fake accounts are up and running. Networks of uh, botted accounts or automated accounts are already running. There are already interest groups on Facebook and on other platforms that are being used now uh, to, um, to enforce the disinformation that's coming out related to coronavirus. Uh, and these are networks to some extent that we already knew about. Um, we knew about the social media manipulation service, for example. There was a report from the CUE that came last year called Falling Behind that talks about how easy it is to purchase fake like, purchase fake use, purchase shares, for example. Uh, and this infrastructure is the same infrastructure that we've seen for years, but now it's being directed at the coronavirus um, related information and it's being exploited increasingly by actors. So that this is the question, of course, if we knew about these actors, if we knew about these networks, if we knew about this infrastructure, infrastructure how much of this could we have uh, preempted and how much could we have stopped before if the companies had the mandate, if government had the mandate, and if we knew that this could have such devastating consequences. 
Uh, finally, my third point uh, is the one on government responses, which I also think is really interesting because a lot of governments right now are reacting quite strongly to the disinformation that's being spread. But the main reaction is to bolster their own strategic communication efforts to make sure that the right communication is out there, because in a sense, that is the best tool uh, that we have. But still, even if we've spent quite a lot of money all around the world in trying to improve our societal resilience and trying to uh, find different uh, counter measures to put in place, uh, this information is still running rampant and still having a very big effect. So there's the question of to what extent these measures have been impactful. I think a lesson coming out of Taiwan that I think is interesting is that um, societal awareness of this information occurring seem to be a key success factor uh, that they consider over there. That means that uh, inoculation and preparing the population for what could happen in the future has been um, something that's been important. But of course, that's too late to start with now when it comes to responding to COVID-19. Uh, we need measures that we can implement here and now. And the question is, which measures are appropriate and how do we implement them in a good and democratic way? So that would be my three points to to start off with and to, to answer your question there, Jan, is, well, some things are the same, other things are not. Well, one thing that I don't think is the same is uh, before this whole uh, pandemic uh, became also an infodemic, uh, I think uh, this uh, uh, ability to reference back to the experts or value of experts was, was, was actually on the decline. Um, what is your view, Hendrik? Is it, is it still in decline or are we seeing a new trend where actually for many the experts, especially in the medical space, have become uh, the new reference point? And isn't there the kind of backtracking the trend we've seen so far? And if that's so, why is that? That, that is a very interesting point because the role of the expert in this, in this crisis is at least to me very, very unclear. Um, experts don't really agree on what the best response is to the coronavirus pandemic. Experts don't really agree on how the virus works and what we can do about the virus and how we can deal with the virus, right? And that puts us in a very peculiar situation because one of the main points for countering disinformation in the past, or one of the main truths of countering disinformation has been to trust the experts and to publish the expert judgments, to publish the truth, to base your, your uh, communication on facts. That is quite hard when a lot of the facts uh, are uncertain in relation to the virus itself. Um, so when we talk about, for example, that uh, drinking silver water isn't an effective remedy to the coronavirus, that's, that's uh, scientifically proven that it's not. Um, we face the challenge that people will say, well, the researchers don't know what's uh, good for the coronavirus. There's not enough evidence. So how do you know that uh, drinking silver water doesn't work? Uh, so it puts the experts in a very peculiar situation when there is no hard truth to, to navigate around. The, the hard truth is, is being discovered right now by the medical professionals. Uh, and that, that is a real challenge for countering disinformation. Well, that is correct. But then still, somebody has to make a decision and substantiate that decision with something that people can uh, refer to and uh, be able to, to cross-check at least. Um, I've seen actually in, in some information environments, and most notably my own, that I think there's been a bit of a reverse of uh, actually much more referencing to a number of uh, newly discovered uh, experts in a Latvian information space. And mm -hmm. probably it's also largely due to, due to the fact that I think that most of the public would, would, would think that this response of a government and a medical system has been uh, to the point. Uh, whether that's uh, right or not, we'll see, but I think there's an interesting uh, reverse, at least in some of the information spaces. Now, uh, Nora, um, we've been moving all of our lives basically online. There's been a dispute of what's good, what's safe. What do you think is happening with our privacy with this, this new move? Do we really think about it? Are we still actually private? Or, you know, anybody who wants to uh, uh, get into our bedrooms and are able to mm -hmm. see whatever we're doing that during the night? Well, internet was never designed to be a private space. Uh, it is very open and everyone on the internet is uh, anonymous pretty much. 
and the way it's designed because nobody pays for anything online so we view websites for free the way it's designed is when we want to access services or websites we we, we have to give up some data to view it so the whole internet structure is based on this principle you need to give up your data to access the the free services um, which kind of makes them not free <laughs> you pay you pay for them uh, with your data so this hasn't changed that that has been there since the beginning of the internet and um, of course as we spend more time um, online we we generate more data about ourselves and that is one of uh, one of the risks with the COVID-19 that we will probably feel the impact for some time afterwards. Uh, because we have moved, uh, with, with entire countries on lockdown, we have moved so much of our lives online, working lives, teaching, education, uh, social connection, communication. Uh, and we don't know if it's ever going to go back to what it used to be. We might this might be our way of just fast forwarding into fully digital life and we still haven't fixed the problems uh, that there were b before before this huge step so um what is happening to the privacy i think we'll just have even less privacy as we spend more time online um unless we do something about it um i think henrik briefly mentioned this um um, this concept of data brokers. So these are companies whose sole purpose is to uh, aggregate personal data uh, from websites, from services, from social networks, and then resell it to marketers. Now, this is a space, uh, this is a market space that's largely unregulated. And with this huge move to the online environment, I think the first thing we need to do is uh, to step up and start regulating this segment of the market. Um, yeah, that's that's it, I guess, about privacy. Well, what are the things that you see in the current environment uh, that you think uh, are are particular to this situation, and what would be the symptomatics or the trends that you want to draw our attention to? So, um, in terms of cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity hackers have always preyed on victims uh, after, shortly after uh, disasters or high-profile events. Uh, and COVID is not uh, different in a way because we have already seen some very large hacks with the Zoom hack, uh, the COVID-19 map that was hacked, um, and of course uh, all this disinformation uh, impersonation. So the techniques definitely remain the same. Uh, the pattern of um, attacking and um, more actively praying uh, during or shortly after a crisis is also the same. Uh, what is different is, like I said, because of this crisis, we have moved our entire lives online. We're even more vulnerable to these sort of attacks. So um, what these attacks usually do, they take advantage of human emotion. Of course, we're all very emotional because we're going through a difficult time. Uh, it's a very new virus. Nobody knows uh, anything about it. We try to get information and we never think about, you know, what sources we like. The, what sort of source I'm reading, uh, what is happening in the background. Uh, how internet operates. These are like secondary thoughts as you're trying to figure out uh, um, what to do during this crisis. So um, we'll have to, uh, we have to pay more attention to uh, cybersecurity in particular. Uh, also something I, I want to bring to everyone's attention is um, of course uh, technology can help us. Um, well, first of all, technology, uh, technology is helping us to stay afloat as um, uh, organizations and, and countries go on lockdown. Uh, but at the same time, uh, previously, we, we never really uh, practiced this so-called security first development. So you would uh, quickly create something to get it out, uh, to give it to your, um, let's say, customer. Uh, and you never thought, well, you don't really think about the security first time. So, um, and of course, countries uh, now, in response to COVID, are um, 
deploying and developing solutions, technological solutions. So one thing I want to bring to everyone's mind is when it comes to these new solutions uh, from this moment onwards, we need to take security into account. We should design solutions with security first in mind because there is no point to use technology, new shiny tech to solve COVID if you, if you just bring in another ve attack vector, essentially. Um, I think that's it for me for now. <laughs> okay, well, uh, let me kind of pick uh, on one, one, one thing is that, yes, a lot of that disinformation, I think all of us said that is, is the online. And, and one of the key, key vectors is the social media and peer-to-peer -peer messaging apps. And these, by the way, are the companies that are not actually suffering too much from the uh, economic uh, uh, problems uh, of the, uh, cr created by the COVID. Uh, do you think they've been responsible in their response of tackling what is happening in their own um, backyard? Have they been stepping up their, uh, their effort? Is there a sizable effect from what they do? Or, or there's, there's not much that we can see? So um, I think Hendrik might be better uh, in answering um, how social media is tackling this information. Uh, but I do know that uh, social media companies uh, such as Facebook and Google, they have been very uh, forthcoming to the government and offering, um, offering uh, different kind of tools uh, and data solutions for effective uh, COVID countering and also uh, for match, uh, kind of like promoting the right sources, uh, information sources in this COVID, uh, COVID crisis. I think that's, uh, that's a lot better than they usually do. Um, however, um, what I have noticed from just monitoring uh, online media in, the, uh, in Latvia, people still communicate um, very much um, in closed groups. So we have seen um, an increase in, in closed groups being created just purely for uh, sharing COVID-related information or trying to get back um, uh, they get back home, like to their home countries, or even some anti-establishment groups have been uh, have been created just before, well, as the COVID crisis was unfolding. So I cannot comment on how effective these um, information matching solutions are, because people are still, well, still and increasingly, are trying to find information in private spaces, private groups of these social media. But they, they definitely are uh, putting effort uh, in terms of uh, promoting the right sources, um, ha handing out free ad credits and everything. And also very in interestingly, and I think that's something the governments need to take up, uh, is they're offering these um, data solutions. So they're essentially they're opening up their aggregated data for um, better tack uh, tackling and predicting uh, the spread of COVID. So, for example, Facebook has this uh, social uh, index. They have done a study where they discovered that um, uh, people, um, people travel where they have Facebook friends. And where they travel is where they spread COVID <laughs> in these times. So you could say that uh, the social index of Facebook could be uh, one indicator of um, well, social connect connectedness and index of Facebook could be one indicator where COVID might spread next. But our governments and our government institutions are not used to using this sort of data. They're not used to using any data insights. So uh, these offers, these offers of uh, use our amazing data to predict uh, where the pandemic will go is. Um, they, they're just not being used because we're not ready to, to use them. Well, do you hear governments? Uh, oh, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can do better with uh, using data. Actually, I agree with, uh, uh, with Nora. I think there is more, um, 
uh, more that governments can do and the capacity can be improved. But Henrik, on, on, the, on social media response, what is your take? Yeah, so like Nora, I agree that they're, if the question is if they're doing a good job, I say that they're doing uh, both a good job and not the, such a good job. It's, 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 it's both yes and no in this case, because obviously the social media companies are trying very hard to, uh, to improve the situation here from whatever they can do with there. And Nora already mentioned data sharing, but they also work very hard to make sure that uh, the right content is promoted so that government sources and official sources from the WHO, for example, are the ones that come up first when you look for these issues. Uh, both Pinterest and Instagram have been very good at this. And uh, Google, when you Google coronavirus, um, someone in Chef can fact check me on this, but I read at least if you Google coronavirus, you don't get any sponsored links, for example. You don't get any, um, any like there's no algorithms that determine your search results, but you will get the WHO and the confirmed sources for your countries first. So obviously they are, they are trying. Um, a big problem, though, for the social media companies in particular is that a lot of the disinformation that's been spread on these platforms is completely organic, at least from what they can tell. They use, the, uh, they use mainly network data to, to determine whether or not something is uh, coordinated. So coordinated uh, inauthentic behavior is the term that Facebook would use, for example. Uh, and that's basically something they determine um, using technical information. And a lot of the disinformation that's spread right now perhaps originates from an inauthentic source, but is spread by authentic users. And that is much more difficult for them to deal with than if there was a coordinated network. Uh, of course, there are networks, but they're not seeing it from what I've, from what I've heard, at least, uh, to such a big extent. Uh, the organic disinformation or the disinformation that's spread by normal people, so to say, uh, poses a very big ethical dilemma for these companies because if you ban um, a legitimate account from Facebook for spreading something that they thought was real, for example, you lock this person out from their social connections in a time of crisis where they perhaps would need their friends the most, right? Uh, so it becomes a big problem for them how to moderate this. And to add to this, of course, is that many of the social media companies have staffing issues when it comes to their content moderation right now. Uh, so Facebook usually prides themselves with having 30,000 or so content moderators around the world. Uh, and these are people that work as consultants for, for the main company. And they sit in a call center style um, office where they work with uh, moderating content. And when they can't go to the office anymore, when homework is encouraged, they can't necessarily export all, the, all their systems. So their moderation is, is, is lacking. Um, some platforms have switched to uh, artificial intelligence and to machine learning algorithms to, to moderate them. And this is uh, also a bit of a problem, right? Because the shift uh, happened overnight and these algorithms are not necessarily trained on, on uh, the data they would need to be trained on. Uh, we could see it um, immediately when this happened. Uh, there, there was an outcry of legitimate news channels being banned um, in their reports about the coronavirus as being fake news because the algorithms couldn't separate between um, uh, certain channels, right? So, so these algorithms are causing some problems as well. Okay, um, um, uh, then uh, we have quite a lot of uh, uh, big audience and uh, a number of questions coming in. Therefore, I think we have to put our audience into the discussion. And of course, thank you for the questions that already have been coming in. And in the comment section, you can pose and we will hopefully be able to pose those. And the first one I, I see from the audience, uh, the question on China. And basically, a uh, two-sided question. What kind of the uh, disinformation methodologies China has been using? And is China, uh, can it be called that China is in the information warfare with the West at this point? What are your takes on that? Uh, so I can go first, if you don't mind, Nora. Um, I, I, I'd like to start with saying that I'm not a China expert. So, so uh, everything I say in relation to China will have to be considered in that context, right? But it's, it's uh, uh, first of all, it's hard to know at this point because we would need to study what's coming out of China right now and uh, do some more investigations into what is actually disinformation, what is actually what is misinformation, what is something that's, you know, ambiguous. So we would need to study it a bit more to, to actually know the full scope of, of what's going on. But it is quite clear that uh, China has been very good at exploiting the information environment that, uh, during this crisis. Um, 
a lot of their activities have been about managing their own reputation and saving face after being the originating country for this virus, as far as we can tell at this moment anyway, um, and their initial handling of, of, of the crisis, right? So, so trying to portray China in a favorable light under these circumstances has been a very big task. And uh, But the fact is that it seems like China has been quite successful in this regard. They've been using what's now being referred to as a mask diplomacy, um, they've been very good at communicating, not only using uh, more conspicuous types of information, but also by their actions. So just sending masks around the world to every other country, combining that activity with a communication plan, uh, which combines multiple types of communication in the digital space, that's quite powerful. Even if the quality of these masks have been lacking in very many regards, uh, the sense that people get from this is that China's doing something. Uh, and that's a big contributing factor to them um, to them trying to to save face. In this sense, it's not necessarily a disinformation campaign, uh, even though there are clear instances of disinformation interwoven in this. It's more of a hybrid influence campaign where all the different tools at the state's disposal are being used to influence people to improve their perception of China and to shift blame for what's going on. Nora, anything to add? Nothing to add. Okay, so basically uh, China has been in the blame game, uh, trying to shift the blame for, for, for whose initial response uh, was lacking and why we all are in this place which we are in right now. The other sets of questions are actually going on to the privacy and kind of also uh, seeps into this uh, question I wanted to have a bit uh, more in-depth discussion. Um, Nora, you just described that, yes, there are a large number of companies whose primary business is actually getting our data, and once you peer in some of the data sets that they have, it's actually so, so incredibly nuanced and specific to the point that you don't believe you have any privacy left They're peering into your thoughts in a way. And on the other side, the government. The government have had access to data, but I don't think they've ever had this new data, big data-based approach to that. And I think there's been some global uh, cases where I think started with Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, where there have been a, a, a interesting ways how technology, app technology, tracking technology have been used uh, for um, controlling whether people are observing their quarantine, whether they're, they're, they're self-isolating, the ones that have to uh, self-isolate, and there have been the apps that are trying to kind of uh, uh, follow the contact persons. What is the line? Should governments go into that? Is it good? Is it bad? Where is this balance between, you know, curtailing coronavirus, saving lives, getting economy back on track somewhat versus the privacy that is taken away. Where's the balance? What are your takes, uh, Nora? Um, so, um, the short answer is, uh, well, the short, my short answer would be that uh, the balance is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, but I, I personally believe that uh, we should use technology. I mean, um, uh, we all give up parts of our pri privacy to live in a secure environment. And um, we do it in the physical world as well. We have uh, forms of identification. We have uh, police, uh, police uh, officers and stations. I mean, this is how the physical world and our societies work. So I think some sort of uh, form of um, uh, privacy for security should translate in the digital world as well. Uh, of course, it shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't fall into a, a huge surveillance state, but in, in the context of COVID, it is a huge security risk. And uh, even, you, you can ask yourself as, uh, I don't know, a, a potential <laughs> a person who's uh, infected with COVID, like, do you, would you want to know that you're infected so you can protect your family and friends? If yes, then what you need to give up is your privacy. You need to go, uh, go to the infectious disease control center, give up your name, surname, address, phone number 
get them to test you in return for that. And then after you receive your test, you can protect yourself and your family and your friends. I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's understandable that in, um, in this context, we would give up more privacy to, to get more security. And why technology comes in place is because you can do these things with technology more effectively. Of course, you could go to, uh, to, um, uh, to get tested and then every uh, doctor tries and checks, uh, to check you every day, but you could use technology to effectively uh, and saving human resources uh, to check up on people who need to be in the quarantine, not to track them, but to check up on them. I think it's, it's, it's what the, the government should do, but that's my opinion. <laughs> okay, over to Henrik. Uh, do you agree or you have a different take? I agree with some parts of it. Uh, I think for <laughs> I think for me the the um, the issue like I, I like your analogy, Dora, that it's it's a false dichotomy that you know either you have um, either you have integrity or you have security, right? But it's it's always a trade off, and the the trade off is some something that we have in the physical world. So I think that's a really good point that we it's not only a digital problem. This is something that people should think about more in relation to what you kind of do in your normal life as well. Uh, but for me, the difference there is that we normally understand what it is we're doing in the physical world. If you go to the doctor and you give your blood sample, you understand that they will test your blood sample and that that blood sample sample can be traced to you. Um, and you also give your consent for doing this by going there. And it's a, a very conscious act to to get this or to produce this piece of information. Whereas online, we don't really understand what type of information we produce and what type of data we generate about ourselves. So when this data is being traded and sold and used by governments in a way that we never even imagined that it could be used, um, that there is this issue of whether or not that is morally justifiable and, and whether or not it's, it's within the remits of w w what's legal. So that depends on a national context, right? Uh, but there is also another problem, that, and that is that this data can be used for so many different purposes. Mm -hmm. So if the government, for example, procures uh, geolocalization data to track the, how people are traveling during Easter holidays or whatever, um, that data can also be used for a million other things. So that data is very valuable, not only for this specific purpose. And most governments who do these kinds of things, at least in, in, in uh, the Western world, they, they, they claim that, well, we're only dealing with uh, anonymized data. But research has already shown that it's quite easy to de-anonymize data. The, the New York Times did a very good report where they de-anonymized localization data for um, people working at the Secret Service, for example. So people who should have uh, or be more protected against these things, they could just buy their data and they could see where they were going, where they were living, where they were moving on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's easy to believe that we buy data for uh, a good cause. We need it to prevent the spread of the disease. So that's, that justifies it. And the data is anonymous, so then it's okay. But the fact is that the data has thousands of other applications and that it can quite easily be used with, with malicious purpose. Yep. So for me, I would need governments to kind of make clear what they're using the data for and to put in place regulation for how they use and preserve the data for, for future purposes. I think for me, I, I find it uh, quite interesting that people are readily giving up their data with the consent for um, pretty mundane things like free app or getting to read a specific uh, news or watch a video without ever considering the implications of what kind of information that brings to someone. And on the other side, kind of governments actually being much more I would say repressive organs being kind of much more hopefully cautious with that. Uh, but we have to recognize there is overall issue with people recognizing the value of the data and the behavior they do in the online in, uh, environment as implying the, the, the scale of the data somebody is getting. And it's kind of easy to, to picture that in a sense of the government not, wa not wanting to spy on you. But then at the same time, they're doing that for so many others, and that can be bought by anyone if they have interest and money. Uh, but frankly, I, I think there's a, um, basically, you can use technology for that in a democratic society, but first, 
I don't think there has to be a, a way that government says you have to do something. That has to be a freedom. That has to be society's readiness to give for a collective good something that they control, they know what they, uh, what they uh, give up exactly, and that they are in the control how it can be used. And there's no centralized controls on one part. And secondarily, there's clear way and transparent way for what it is used. In, in this case, just for epidemiological response rather than any other responses. And I think the, the other key take, uh, point is it should stop once it's over. Of course, as you, Hendrik, said, well, yes, data is very valuable. And of course, governments will have to go into this data business because that makes them more efficient. But in a way, that doesn't compromise the values and uh, freedoms in a democratic society. A very fine line, but I think uh, my take on that is that if there is a way we can help people survive, more people survive, and quicker get out of the uh, economic uh, downturn, we should take it, but with a great caution and the number of built-in security mechanisms. That's my personal point of view. And, and that, I think, is something that we have to also, one of the things of lessons learned we have to take into the future is this, how do we embrace the technological possi uh, possibilities while keeping freedom and values in place? And that, I think, is probably one of the uh, things that we will have to take uh, from this, uh, um, from this uh, situation. Um, one question I have is actually quite pertinent to this. Is COVID a game changer in a digital security? What do you think? Is it? Um, Mora, do you want to take a stab at this? Yeah, well, I, I, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it might be. I mean, I think it's too early to speculate, uh, but it might be. As uh, you, Janet, were speaking uh, about uh, how to use data and technology um, in a ethical manner and way, uh, I, I just got this idea that, uh, well, I, I still think that governments should use tech uh, to try and contain the, the spread of the pandemic. But I also agree with uh, Henrik that, that when it comes to digital space, um, a lot of people, when they opt in for things or they give up their data, they actually don't give informed consent because they don't know what is happening to that data. So uh, so my analogy with the physical world is uh, flawed in that sense, sense because uh, in the physical world, you, you, you're you more likely to have an informed consent to why do you give up your data, for what reasons and what will happen to it. Whereas in um, the digital space, it, um, it was never the case. Uh, what this pandemic might change in terms of digital security and privacy. Well, I hope, fingers crossed. Uh, there's actually, um, you can design systems with, uh, well, first of all, security first and privacy first in mind. So you don't, um, I think this contact tracing app that Singapore developed is a very good example. Of course, you can develop a contact tracing app that feeds back all people's contacts and locations back to one central server or you could develop it in a way that, um, that the device owner holds their data on their device and they get their view of their co contacts and nobody else does it. And everyone has this very personalized, personalized view on their device and uh, there's no central server that uh, is able to uh, tap into this data. So hopefully this pandemic can, um, well, first of all, I hope uh, we will, um, understand the importance of data and technology in uh, such crisis situation and we will leverage it. But as democratic uh, countries and societies, I hope uh, we will do it um, with privacy and uh, uh, rights to privacy in mind. So we start actually innovate technology that does not, um, is not based on endless data sharing and reselling, but 
uh, giving more control over to the user. Henrik, um, the, the other question I, I, I'm seeing here is, is that I want to ask you is, um, given this cognitive landscape where people are kind of uh, trying to, to cling to what they believe and, and look for everything that substantiates that point of view, is there any way we can get these people out of their echo chambers or we leave them there? <laughs> Uh, it, it is a very good question. The, 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 the debate that's been going around the last couple of years has been uh, centered around polarization to, to a large extent, right? That societies are becoming more and more polarized and people are becoming centered in smaller social groups where they have sp very specific opinions. And that, uh, that is a big problem that's only being exacerbated by th this type of crisis. I think a lot of the efforts made by government right now need to be directed at reaching uh, special interest groups and smaller um, polarized groups with correct information about what is going on. Um, the question of how to bring people out of these groups in, in the future is, is more, more broad. I mean, it's it's not the government's prerogative to tell people what to think and what to believe, uh, but it is the government's prerogative to make sure that everyone has access to correct information uh, when it comes to health and safety, for example. Um, the risk with what we see right now is that um, since a lot of people are afraid, since a lot of people are looking for answers, they will be drawn to uh, very niche communities, which are in, which is in itself not a big problem necessarily, but which can lead to bigger problems in the future. Uh, it's the kind of radicalization mechanisms we've seen previously happening on social media. Um, it's, it's easy to attract someone into a questionable cause when they are afraid of, of, um, of the situation around them, right? Uh, but I would, I would just like to, to um, spend a couple seconds on, on a point that Nora made before here, also about the um, uh, access to information and uh, the hopes that governments won't abuse this power. Uh, one of the issues that I hope will be more widely debated generally is how to scale this back in the future when the crisis is over. Uh, because now, obviously, everyone is in a crisis mindset where we're willing to be quite pragmatic about what we do. So if data about people's uh, location can help us prevent the spread of the virus, that's, that's a good enough reason to have that data. Uh, the problem is that when you acquire something that's very convenient for you, it's very hard to get rid of it. So uh, when governments see how useful it is to have this type of data access, how willing will they be to, to remove this data access in the future? Or is this the new norm? And that's something that I think uh, we need to debate much more. How will we roll back when it comes to these privileges that we've been afforded by this crisis in terms of data access? Um, I agree, and, and there's a bigger question linked to that, and that is how do you keep up the efficient governance in this data decision-driven world? Where many other governments, as we've seen, and not in democratic governments, have been very much embracing this attitude. So there's a myriad of questions that have to be answered that are very important and I think will be, I, I would hope this will be one of the catalysts that we will have to think about. But, but certainly I do think that we will have to think about the ways we integrate technology into our future democratic uh, values and freedoms concept. But, but that's not an easy uh, question. Now we're um, 11 minutes left. Uh, now let's start to move a bit more to the you know, practical tips and tricks. And there's one, one question that kind of leads it. Uh, how do we explain to people what governments, military, police, why we, uh, they are right in taking away these rights temporarily? Like, I think there's been a lot of debate that there have been so many pretty fundamental rights that we've grown with, taken away in a matter of days. How do we go out to the society and make them understand that? And on top of this, if you think of any tips and tricks you can give to our listeners, what you could suggest, uh, are there any devices, platforms, things that you would suggest would be helpful in this moment to understand uh, what is happening, to actually understand the players, and ultimately to probably uh, help uh, people to disseminate their messages. Who's ready to take this one first? Um, I, can, uh, I can have a small answer to this question. So 
from my experience monitoring what's happening in Latvia during COVID, um, I, well, I think our country responded pretty quickly and uh, the, the society took it well initially. But uh, as the measurements increase, um, but the but the infection, uh, the cases of in infected people and uh, mortality rates uh, did not increase as as quickly as the measures, uh, and uh, there were no um, known public examples of anyone having COVID or suffering from it. People started like we noticed that in these closed groups, people started um, started wondering about is this not a huge <laughs> a huge scheme just to get everyone <laughs> well like. <laughs> Like Henrik said, get everyone inside so they can put the 5G antennas up. That's one. That's one. Uh, but I think um, when, um, in parallel to increasing the the restrictions and um, um, cautionary measures, you do need to communicate very clearly why you're doing it. And the more examples, then I guess uh, account personal accounts the better, because people relate with other people. People don't really relate that much with graphs and numbers. So I would say um, personal accounts of um, people who suffer <laughs> or situations in the hospitals. So emotions and credibility. Uh, Henrik? <laughs> Yeah, so coming at this from a Stratcom perspective, and also perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm from Sweden, so uh, a country that's caused much controversy uh, in the international arena because of our, our uh, somewhat soft response to, to the crisis. Uh, some of the things that I've noticed that I'm lacking when it comes to uh, government communication, not here only, but what I see internationally as well, is first of all, uh, to communicate uncertainty. Uh, I think some communicators have been really good at talking about this situation as something uh, unknown. We don't know what's going to happen because this is a new situation. Uh, being clear with where your uncertainties are makes it understandable why you make certain choices. And, and I think we need more of that in a situation like this, which is very humbling for everyone who's, who's dealing with it. And related to that, I'm, I'm also missing uh, forward-looking communications. Um, so. Everyone, there is, there's constant information updates nowadays. And every day we see a new press conference uh, from every country in the world about what they're doing here and now. But only very few people and very few countries have adopted a stance where they actually talk about future possibilities. So if you say that uh, today we're going to lock down, um, I don't know what, so today we're going to lock down the schools. Tomorrow it may be that we also need to lock down the factories. It may also be that we also need to lock down something else. That's something that kind of primes your audience uh, to be accepting of a future reform that you may need to make. Uh, a lot of people come out and say what they're doing and what they have done in the past, and they don't dare to, to speculate about what's going to happen in the future. In, in one way, that's fine. Uh, but in another way, if you want to, your audience to be on board with what you're doing, it's quite nice to, to use an opportunity to prime them a bit more with forward-looking communications. It doesn't have to be, uh, um, you know, you looking in a... Um, um, into the crystal ball to, to see what's going to happen. More like these are some of the options that may come into play, right? That will prime your audience. Uh, uh, another thing that I think is really important, sorry, Yannis, to disturb, to disturb you there, but, but uh, it is to have a very good target audience analysis uh, as a backdrop for your communications. Uh, you really need to consider which audiences you want to communicate with. Uh, one thing we've seen in a couple of different countries, not at least here in the Nordics, is that uh, a lot of people who have been heavily affected by the COVID disease has been minorities who may not communicate very well in the main language of the country. Uh, these groups and these communities need to be reached as well if we want to limit the spread of this disease. And that's something that you will understand if you do a proper target audience analysis for your communication. So focusing on your target audience, uh, not being afraid to communicate uncertainty and also having a communication that's forward-looking. Those would be my three takeaways. And I would add also, of course, with a very careful balance, actually, the, uh, the images of the, uh, the mass graves that have to be dug in some of the uh, COVID-stricken uh, places. I think the things like these, very emotional uh, referencing to specific unimaginable before situations, I think also kind of put things to the audience in perspective. Before we uh, go on to finish, there's an interesting question I, 
I'm actually uh, quite interested uh, to have your uh, take on, and that's uh, uh, saying that Africa is worried about Western incursion into Africa's info-digital space. Is this masterminded by ordinary citizens uh, without government interests? Um, well, I have to say we've not been tracking too much uh, African information space. Uh, but have you points on that? Um, Western, like, sorry, go on. Go, no, go ahead, Nora, please. No, I, I just wanted to clarify the question. Is it like um, uh, Western technology uh, in Africa or? Uh, I, I think the, the probably do things the is that most of the info digital space as most in most of the world is designed and defined by the Western uh, digital companies. And probably there is uh, potentially some activity from our citizens in their language spaces, but that's a speculation. Um, I've just read the, um, as, you, as you see, uh, the one that um, actually asked that question, at least on our part, we've been not aware of that kind of a problem, what we've been aware is, is that there is a, a significant disinformation ecosystem in, in Africa, in most of the places, and that it is basically driven mostly by the media literacy levels uh, compared to to number of other places. That was our initial assessment. Otherwise, I think the digital info spaces uh, everywhere, but some places on the planet, are dominated by few few players and uh, um, there's not much, uh, that's the global market. Okay, uh, mm. now with uh, this uh, time coming close, uh, last question quickly for both of you. Um, how do we get back to normal from this in the information space? Um, will we get back to normal in the information space? One minute each, please. Um, Nora. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I think we will, as the pandemic uh, calms down, I think we will start look for information. We will talk uh, about other things other than COVID. Um, yeah, I, how do we get back to normal? Um, so I think Try and make it go away quicker, self-isolate, um, <laughs> <laughs> deploy technology. Um, yeah, just, uh, I think it will uh, come naturally as the pandemic comes and we will. Um, Henrik, you are optimist? Um, well, maybe not as much as Nora in this case. Uh, it's usually the other way around, I feel like, but uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I'm sure we will come back to some sense of normality. Um, my fear is that uh, we come back to a normality where uh, we have kind of normalized having these privacy intrusions, where we've normalized uh, sacrificing a big portion of our integrity uh, for security, which is security which is not really needed. Uh, so my advice going forward coming out of this crisis would mainly be to make sure that we have the democratic values in the forefront of whatever we do to combat this disease. Um, there are values that are worth preserving um, and uh, values that we should have in our mind when we design policy. So we shouldn't just act out of panic when it comes to dealing with Corona. We should also consider the impact our actions have on other values that are also important to our societies. Well, thank you. From my part, I would say we will be back to normal. Actually, pandemics is nothing not usual for the human uh, history. It's been a normal part of uh, the human life over uh, millennia. We just happen to have believed that we've taken control over this particular problem, and we obviously see that is not the case. And that will be probably one of the adjustments we'll have to make um, in other words, we also see that the, uh, the, the preparations that governments, societies have done to increase their disinformation resilience have paid off in this particular moment. We are seeing also that the, on the bad actors part, most of the infrastructure that was active before uh, 
is being used also in the current circumstances probably with more vigor. So whatever we've done previously is e either hunting us or paying off at this point in time. And that is, I think, uh, bringing us uh, back the point that we have to prepare before the crisis have struck. That's a normal idea for somebody within the national security or military, but I think that's a, a point to the larger society. Also, like with a virus, everybody is responsible to make our information space more clean, more fact-related, more civil, more uh, dependable. And it's not something that we can uh, delegate to a given government because that leads to a very bad, bad uh, situation. What is or what has to happen is that this society has to uh, uh, take its role and be the ones that are looking at the facts, are looking at what the different experts are saying, and are trying to be a positive amplifiers and recognize when they're falling in for the uh, subjective judgments. And that's very important. I think also technology will have to once again go and, 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 and try to answer the question, what kind of role can this new data AI technology play in a democratic society? Uh, in a way that creates the benefits, but doesn't undermine the key values and freedoms. And I think this is, this is going to be one of the uh, fundamental questions as we go out of this crisis. The other thing that I also I think is important is that uh, we will have a lesson learned that covering up or not being transparent and truthful is not a good strategy. We've been saying that for quite some time. Some don't believe that as, as a viable strategy, but I think that's what we're gonna learn from this crisis. And of course, we will survive, we will endure. There will be a world with a lot of difficulties ahead of us, but I think uh, it's key that we we, we take away the lessons and uh, we become more educated and better as societies out of that. It's not given, but something that we can all make happen. Um, thank you everyone for watching uh, this uh, webinar. That was first in a series um, and we are going to continue so the, uh, watch out for the uh, next, uh, next alert, for the next webinars. We're going to uh, tackle a number of interesting uh, questions fr starting from deep fakes uh, to the digital security to the um, different uh, aspects of our strategic communication. We'll just move to this digital uh, world. And I hope to see you back in this environment. And of course, fingers crossed, I'm uh, an old school person. I want to see you in person at some point, hopefully sooner rather than later. Keep safe and see you next time.